good evening and uh, welcome to this how-to event with uh, the great George Packer. Uh, I am Matt Lancona, I'm an editor at Tortoise Media and I'm especially delighted to be hosting this event. Um, Sol Bello, uh, who's another one of my intellectual heroes, wrote that uh, crisis chatter is one of the great afflictions of modern times and he also advised his readers elsewhere to look out for the what he called unignorable chroniclers of any era and um, George Packer is certainly one of the unignorable chroniclers of our time um, as you'll know from his great and award-winning book The Unwinding um, and his terrific writings in the Atlantic most recently if you haven't checked it out do so the excellent piece he wrote on Donald Rumsfeld this week and now this book uh, Last Best Hope uh, which is full of uh, thoughts about, as, you, as the subtitle says, American, in, American crisis and renewal, but it's also, I think, uh, extremely relevant to the British experience and, and indeed other uh, countries that are, are going through um, division, um, populist upsurge, and of course, the, the coping with the, the pandemic. Do please put your uh, questions to, to George into the Q&A box, and we'll try and uh, get to them as many of them as we can in the course of the, the hour. I don't want to waste any more time though, uh, but just to dive straight in and say welcome to you, George. Thank you for doing this. Thanks for having me, Matthew. It's really a pleasure to be with you. It's, uh, it's, it's such an important book, this, I think. And it's animated, if I may take the liberty of sort of describing it from my own point of view, by a sense of emergency, but also a uh, sense of practical and stubborn optimism. Um, and one of the, the, the most striking moments quite early in the book is that you talk about the way in which America has become the object of pity. And I wonder if you can elaborate on that because it's, it's a very striking moment. Last year, there were, there were even a couple of columns, I think, in uh, the Guardian or the Irish Times that actually express pity for America during the darkest months of the pandemic when we uh, were completely unable to, to govern ourselves, to do the basics. We were the world leader in deaths and in infections from March onward. We still are. Uh, given our population, you know, we, we shouldn't even be close, but this was obviously a direct result of failures of, of our government, our society, of our president at the time, who turned the pandemic into a, another front of the culture war in order to help his own reelection chances. I don't know of any other country in the world, maybe Britain is an exception, you should tell me, where mask wearing became a profound tribal and political identity. And whether or not you were willing to put a mask on, told people what kind of American you were and who you who you were going to vote for, rather than a simple way of keeping yourself and other people safe. So we were we were getting humanitarian aid offers from Russia, Taiwan, and the UN. Um, Americans were trying to find ways to get out of the country, and and usually failing. Um, our passports were suddenly considered like uh, the mark of of, uh, of illness. It was it was as if we had suddenly be, be become the carriers of something even worse than the coronavirus, like some democratic disease that was that was causing us to to just fall apart before the world's eyes. And as the election approached, it seemed very likely that we would have violence on a pretty large scale shopkeepers boarding up their shops, Americans buying weapons and ammo in higher even than usual amounts, and rational people asking their friends if they thought we were going to have a civil war. That was all uh, an America to be pitied and feared. I think it now seems a bit like an exaggerated picture, like a little bit of a panic reaction to things that were real but we should not imagine that it was an illusion because it, 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 I was living through it and feeling a kind of knot in my stomach every day, waking up wondering 
what terrible thing is going to happen to the country today. So you say that the virus had one redeeming feature in that, in your own words, one gift, it interrupted us, which again is an arresting thought. Can you explain what you mean by that? This was especially at the start. Having to stay home, to break up every routine, um, forced people to slow down. I mean, Americans are tremendously active, distracted, people always pursuing the next dream, the next novelty, or the next fight. And suddenly we were stuck with ourselves. And I had this image of staring very long and hard in the mirror and not liking the face that I saw. I mean, this was the face of someone uh, anxious and aging and not coping very well. So it forced us to, to see things that were obvious and yet had been submerged and maybe we had ignored. Things like tremendous class inequality that had created a group of professionals who were the winners of the global economy and who were in, mostly in the cities and who were living off a group of precarious service workers. And we suddenly discovered who we were. The professionals got to sit at home on their asses staring at a laptop during the pandemic and still keeping their paycheck. And the essential workers had to go to work, even if they felt a little bit sick and drive the truck and um, man the checkout counter and um, attend the ill at the hospital. And this was almost like wartime where you suddenly knew who was in uniform and who was not. And it was a source of a bit of shock and maybe shame for the the winners, the professional class, to realize they were the non-essentials. They were the people who the country didn't really need to go to work. That should have, and for a while did give us a strong sense of just how polarized we'd become economically. And then the other side was politically. As I said, the simple question of masking in a supermarket was a decision you made based in some ways, not just on health and fear, but on identification with, with one party or the other, which is lunacy. But it, it took off once Trump turned it into a, uh, a token of, of the culture war. So all that was just staring us in the face throughout the pandemic. It's, it's interesting how you deal with Trump in the book because, and I like it very much because I think that um, there's a, a reflex response to Trump's departure from the scene, which is certainly not confined to America. Uh, it felt very strongly in the UK and elsewhere that, that he's gone. And the, the implication of that or the insinuation of that is that he was somehow, if you like, an invasive force. He was, mm -hmm. it, it, it was all an incursion and now it's been pushed back and the pendulum, that, that, that dreadful metaphor of, um, of, of liberal complacency has swung back right. and we can stop worrying about it. But you pose it, I think, absolutely spot on, which is the question is not who Trump was, but who we are. So what, did, what has Trump taught us about who we are? I mean, not, not perhaps just America, but, but the, 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 the wider world. Yeah, I, I think there's another line in the book where I say a, a failure the size of Trump took all of America. Yeah. It, it could not just be the work of the 46% who, who elected him, although they're, they're responsible, and yeah. I hold them responsible. Uh, and, and those who tried to reelect him, I hold even more responsible because they knew exactly what they were doing by then. But Trump walked onto a landscape that was just open to someone like that, to, to a demagogue, which is to say a democracy in which the people no longer felt like it was their government and their country. This is what I wrote about in The Unwinding. In democracy, the people are supposed to rule. So it's a natural, it's a natural soil for a demagogue to, to arise and to tell them look, you're not ruling, it, you're being ruled by these elites, by these experts, so-called, by these, 
people who are uh, who've come from other countries and don't deserve to be here by these people who don't look like you, who don't go to your church. And it's not that hard when there's a kind of chronic simmering sense of discontent and of, of social resentment as we've had here for many, many years for someone like Trump to, to prey on it, to manipulate it into power. And it really does depend on everyone. I mean, it, it, of course, the resentment is morally tainted by racism and xenophobia and, and, and a lot of ills, but it's also fed by the attitude of the higher classes who do look down on the uneducated, who do look at the people in the middle of the country and wonder why they can't get their act together and enter the modern world and make sure their children get a college education. So there's a mutual suspicion, resentment, scorn, that is just like a fracture there to be touched and widened by anyone willing to, to break things, and that's Trump. So when it came to the pandemic, he immediately sensed, I'm not going to be able to handle this. I don't have the desire or the ability to make, to, to be Angela Merkel all of a sudden. I can't do that. But what I can do is use this to do what I always do, which is turn Americans against each other. But the remarkable thing is not that Trump tried to do it, but that it was so easy to do. And that each side then reacted to the other's extremes by becoming more extreme itself until we were caricatures in opposite corners. Trump was the first president who really was willing to destroy to that degree, but we had to be capable of being that easily destroyed in order for him to be able to do it to us. Yes, the soil was, 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 was fertile. And then in May 2020, um, as if the, the plot isn't thick already, um, comes a, this terrible moment when George Floyd is, is murdered. And then follows a, a, a surge of protests which starts in the United States and then very quickly spread all over the world. Um, and you have some fascinating things to say about the protests, which are obviously your, you have a you know, high degree of sympathy with um, the, the the, the, the sentiments of, of those calling for racial justice and, and right quick. Um, but you also worry, and you use the word, use, use the phrase that they, are, they, they seemed at once utopian and nihilistic. Now, can, can, you, can you walk us through that? Because I think what the content of those protests is a very important kind of signifier for where we go now. The protests were about police brutality. They were about uh, an unjust criminal justice system. And maybe more broadly, they were about the legacy of 400 years of, of slavery and segregation and discrimination and the second class status of so many <clears throat> Black American citizens. And in every way, they were necessary and urgent and overdue. And they were kind of forcing a more complacent older generation to face that we are not making slow but sure progress toward a more perfect union. That in fact, there's something permanently wrong that we've never really been willing to face. All of that was the, the necessary and, and moral thrust of the protest. But then they took a turn <clears throat> the protests and the effect of the protests on our culture that you could sort of see coming maybe for five or six years from before the protests because things have been <coughs> moving in this direction in some institutions. And the turn they took was to insist not on practical changes in institutions, um, not on a politics that could create those changes, and then bring them about, but on a kind of revolution of consciousness that was anti-racist theory and thinking. It, it goes under different names, critical race theory, um, social justice thinking, um, 
wokeness is the pejorative term. And in the professional world, which is where it seemed to migrate, it really became a kind of panic where institutions suddenly felt that they had to show their own bona fides or else they would be taken over. There was an atmosphere almost of revolution within especially like cultural institutions, media, academia, arts, philanthropy, um, and some corners of the Democratic Party itself. And that, I think, tapped into a really a uniquely American attitude toward politics, which is religious, which talks in terms of original sin and 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 <coughs> human frailty as something that has to be accounted for and atoned for and repented and then redeemed, these are absolutes. And they don't allow for the push and pull of different ideas and different values even. They are an orthodoxy. And they set in very quickly and made it almost impossible to have a normal open conversation about the most pressing issues that the protests had raised. Instead, people walked around either with their eyes wide with, you know, with, with virtue and, and the good and justice, you know, just in, within reach, or they walked around in fear, not knowing whether they were going to be fired the next day for something they wrote on social media six years ago. So, it was not, to my mind, an atmosphere in which the ambitions of the protest movement were going to be realized. Instead, it was, it became divisive, it became extreme, and I think it alienated a lot of Americans who may have been sympathetic to police reform, but were not sympathetic to police abolition or prison abolition or having their children taught that whiteness was guilt um, in school. And so Trump actually ended up winning more of the Black and Latino vote than anyone expected, I think partly because um, the protests started pushing the Democratic Party in a direction that it turns out a majority of Americans, including non-white Americans, don't really like. Yes, I, I think it's a, a a cultural trend that's by no means confined to America, and perhaps we can we can talk about that. It, I, I want to discuss the quadrant that you that is in in some respects the core of the book, and you divide um, or you identify a series of narratives, um, all of which are competing and have uh, different historical uh, roots and traditions in the American experience. And it, it, I think it would be useful just to go through them. Um, one by one, and 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 we can perhaps look at the 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 parallels there are in the British experience. But let's kick off with um, um uh, I'll leave the definition to you. Obviously, uh, the, the notion of free America. Tell tell us about free America. So there is a chronology as well, Matthew, and and the chronology begins with free America. It's the most politically influential of them. In the U.S., it was Reagan's America, and in Britain, it was Thatcher's Britain. It was it was a, a repudiation of the welfare state, the post-war welfare state. It was a an almost uh, blind faith in the market as a tool for prosperity and freedom. Low taxes, deregulation, the whole menu of free market policies. In this country. Reagan used those policies to connect to a rhetoric that was very appealing to Americans, the rhetoric of, of the Puritans, of seeking freedom in a new land, of endless opportunity. And when he spoke about it, it sounded like uh, the promised land, except that it led to tremendous inequality and the hollowing out of uh, large regions of the country that had been industrial centers or rural areas that didn't benefit from either the tax policies, the cutting of government programs, or the, uh, the globalization that followed, the free trade agreements, et cetera. So free America is um, the, the libertarian, let's say, philosophy that I think has led to a lot of the 
uh, the, the social decline that we've seen. I mean, 